Okay. All right, so um, in 3.2.2, Hume's positive account of justice really comes into two parts, right? Uh, first, there's a genealogy of justice where Hume is describing the motives and circumstances that first establish the conventions of justice. And the second stage is a separate account of the moral beauty of just actions. So Hume is going to provide a distinct account of what it is uh, that makes it the case that the observances of the conventions of justice have merit and are the objects of moral approbation. Now, one thing that we need to get clear on is what exactly Hume means by justice. Um, so um, Hume means something much more narrow than we do, right? For Hume, justice concerns rules governing property. Um, uh, not only does Hume think that property is impossible without justice, he also believes that justice governs no other thing. Now, uh, <clears throat> many legitimate political concerns that we might describe uh, in terms of uh, uh, justice uh, are not solely concerned with property um, uh, and are not the manifestation of the artificial virtue of justice as Hume conceives of it, okay? Uh, so for example, familiar issues about social justice insofar as they do not concern property, that's not what Hume means by justice. So bear that in mind, by justice Hume primarily means conventions that are governing uh, property. Um, now, uh, so far, uh, we've observed that the natural and artificial virtues differ in a number of specific respects. Uh, natural virtues, uh, their implanted instincts, uh, behavioral dispositions native to the human frame, artificial virtues are not, right? They arise from a uh, human uh, convention. And uh, we also saw that whereas the manifestation of a natural virtue invariably results in some good, that is not the case uh, with respect to uh, the artificial virtues. We saw that uh, the natural virtues, the motive to, before, uh, to act in that way, is the very same principle that makes that action virtuous or vicious. Um, however, um, that's not going to be the case for the artificial virtues, right? Again, Hume tells one story about the original motive that led to the establishment of the conventions of justice. And he tells a separate story about why observances of those conventions have merit and are the objects of moral approbation. Now, there's a fourth difference that is presently relevant, okay? Uh, whereas the natural virtues are partial and unequal, the artificial virtues are impartial and equal. Um, so we're going to explain what that means in a, in a little bit. Uh, so um, according to human, uh, Hume, human beings are by nature partial. And what does he mean this by this? Well, he does, let's begin with what he doesn't mean. He doesn't mean that we're selfish or exclusively uh, uh, selfish. So it's useful uh, to contrast uh, uh, Hume's position uh, with uh, the hobbist. Um, <clears throat> now, the hobbist, is a creature of the philosophical bestiary uh, inspired by the historical Hobbes, uh, but is not can be confused with the historical Hobbes. While there are superficial similarities, uh, Hobbism is the product of a historically salient misinterpretation of Hobbes. Uh, 
Anyway, according to the Hobbist, and here's the historical Hobbes, uh, a portrait of the historical Hobbes. According to the Hobbist, uh, human beings are rational egoists. And what do I mean by this? Well, I mean, they're motivated in a certain way. Uh, so Hob the Hobbist claims that we're only ever, only ever motivated by rational self-interest. So all motivation is ultimately to be explained in terms of what benefits the individual. Uh, while we may appear right to act for the sake of others, we only ever act in those ways because of the in individual benefit it affords us, however indirectly and remotely. So all apparently non-selfish motivation is merely apparent. Now, this is not at all Hume's view. Uh, Hume recognizes, of course, that human beings can act out of their own self-interest, that human beings are sometimes selfish and at times inclined by the uh, natural passion of avarice. Um, however, Hume explicitly denies that we only ever act out of rational self-interest. Importantly, we're naturally inclined to act for the sake of others. Human beings are naturally benevolent, at least to some degree, just as they're naturally amiable to children. So human beings may be no angels, they may be selfish, but they have a natural concern for others that's not reducible to rational self-interest. <clears throat> so what's important for Hume it's not that human beings are selfish. They are, though not exclusively so. Rather, what's important to Hume is that human beings are partial. Now, consider our natural concern for others. Such concern is principally directed towards those who are, we are related in important ways by the bonds of kinship or friendship, say. Uh, while principally directed towards others who are importantly related to us, uh, a concern for others can be extended to those who are distant and unknown to us through uh, the operations of imagination and sympathy. However, um, uh, this concern for the distant and unknown is considerably weaker than our concern uh, for our kin. Our natural affection for others may refute the Hobbes contention that we only ever act selfishly, but our natural concern for others is not impartial. We don't have equal concern for all. We're naturally more concerned to those who are importantly related to us, who are affiliated with us, who are proper to us. We're naturally less concerned, if at all, for the distant and unknown. And while we may not be exclusively selfish, our natural concern for others is partial and unequal. Now, this is going to be very important because it's going to be uh, play a key role, right, in in an argument uh, for uh, 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 the concerning the conventions of justice. Um, but before we get to that argument, uh, let's do a little bit more of some setup. Okay, uh, so uh, let's see. Now, according to Hume, conventions of justice only arise in certain circumstances. Certain conditions have to obtain if the conventions of justice are possible at all. Now, there are two classes of uh, uh, circumstances. There are objective circumstances of, uh, of justice and subjective circumstances of injustice. Let's begin with the objective ones. And there are two. Uh, the, the first Hume describes as the scanty provision of nature, okay? And the idea here is that while human beings have needs, there exists in nature a scarcity of objects that meet our needs. The second 
is uh, the easy exchange of goods. And here, at least some uh, objects of need are easily exchangeable between individuals. Okay, so consider fruit, right? That's food, we need food, right? And food is easily exchangeable uh, between people, right? I might have an apple and I can give you an apple, right? Contrast the air, okay? Now, we obviously need air in order to uh, uh, live, however, right? They, air doesn't admit of an easy exchange, right? Um, no one can own the air the way someone can own an apple. Uh, so let's consider the subjective circumstances, right? Notice the objective circumstances had to do uh, with uh, features of our objective environment. The subjective circumstances of justice have rather to do with uh, elements of our psychology. And the first of the subjective circumstances of justice is selfishness. Uh, and here, again, as human beings, we're naturally, if not exclusively, inclined to act out of our own self-interests. Uh, and while we have a natural concern for others, self-interest for Hume remains a powerful source of human motivation. Um, the second condition is confined benevolence. Uh, as human beings, we've got a natural concern for the well-being of others, at least those who are affiliated with us in a certain way. Now, the treatise speaks of confined generosity. The second inquiry speaks of uh, benevolence. I'm gonna follow the terminology of the second inquiry since talk of confined generosity can, can mislead. If you place the emphasis on confined, right, then confined generosity can be read as a wry description of human uh, selfishness. If, however, the emphasis is placed instead on generosity, then the qualification confined can be read uh, as a um, uh, registering the partial, uh, can be read as uh, emphasizing the uh, partial nature of our benevolent concern for others, right? Uh, and this latter interpretation is consistent uh, with both the treaty's account and the account in the second inquiry. All right, <clears throat> so, uh, so those are the circumstances of justice. And uh, Hume uh, tries to motivate them. And again, remember, the thought is, Justice is only possible when these under these circumstances, right? If any of these circumstances fail, then justice won't be possible. And Hume's going to try to motivate that for us by considering <clears throat> two uh, thought experiments, okay? Uh, uh, the state of nature and uh, the golden age, okay? So let's begin with the state of nature. Now the state of nature is supposed to be the state of humankind prior to the establishment of society. Now Hume doubts uh, that we were ever in the state of nature, or if we were, then he doubts that we remained in that rude and natural state for very long. Uh, so he thus rejects as implausible the Hobbes description of it as the war of all against all. And indeed, uh, like Rousseau, he seems to think that uh, society or, uh, and not the lack of it is more likely to engender conflict. However, Hume does concede that in cases of extremity, uh, where the needs of humanity vastly outweigh uh, the bounty of nature, such that, well, not all could survive, a natural concern for self-preservation couldn't be reasonably constrained by the needs of others. Now notice, in such circumstances, uh, there would be no motivation to observe the rules governing property, and the conventions of justice could neither be established nor sustained in conditions of extreme want. <clears throat> the golden age 
uh, according is according to the poets, the most charming and peaceable condition that can be possibly uh, 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 imagined. Okay, and so the poets are envisioning uh, uh, in envisioning the golden age. Imagine the bounty of nature to increase, so that there is no want. Uh, the benevolence of humanity to increase, so that extends to everyone, so there's no avarice or jealousy. And since establishing the general rules of property would lack utility in the golden age, there's no inconvenience to be remedied by establishing conventions of justice. Such conventions would never be established and justice would simply not be possible in the golden age. <clears throat> now, what unites these thought experiments <clears throat> is that in each, <clears throat> at least one of the circumstances of justice is imagined uh, not to obtain, with the consequence that it's inconceivable that the uh, conventions of justice could be established uh, in the imagined state of affairs. Uh, so in circumstances of extremity, uh, um, uh, uh, if not in the state of nature, uh, there's scarcity Benevolence is not an operation and justice is not uh, possible. Um, uh, in the golden age, uh, in the golden age, there's abundance, selfish inclination is not in operation. And again, justice is not possible. Okay, now I wanna talk a bit about What's the problem that the conventions of justice is meant to solve? And again, it's useful to contrast Hume's view with the view of the hobbist. So let's begin with the view of the hobbist. Um, uh, so uh, given right, the evident disadvantages of life outside of society, Human beings have an interest in the establishment of society. Now, the hobbist sees this as posing two related problems. Call them the coordinative and the motivational problems. The coordinative problem is how we can come to recognize the need to regulate our behavior for mutual advantage. And the motivational problem is how we can be moved uh, by this concern in the face of more immediate and potentially more attractive individual concerns. Crucially, these are not Hume's problems. Hume's problem is not how on purely self-interested grounds, human beings can be moved to constrain at least some of their ends for the sake of mutual advantage, uh, conventions of justice, specifically general rules governing property, could not be a solution that could be pro proposed and acted upon uh, by human beings in the state of nature or in the rude natural state, as Hume sometimes puts it. Here's Hume. He writes, the idea of justice can never serve to this purpose or be taken for a natural principle capable of inspiring men with equitable conduct toward each other. That virtue, as it's now understood, would never have been dreamt of among rude and savage men. Now, conventions of justice couldn't be the solution to the coordination and motivational problems because of a fundamental problem about our idea of justice. Hume seems to think that in the rude natural state, the very idea of justice uh, is lacking. And if we lack the very idea of justice, we couldn't propose the establishment of the conventions of justice as a remedy to the disadvantages of life outside of society. And if someone did propose them, we wouldn't understand it because we lack the idea of justice. Okay, now this is uh, important and it connects up uh, with material from the very first lecture concerning book one. Now, remember, 
questions about the origins of our ideas are familiar from book one, where Hume posed probing questions about the origin of metaphysically important ideas such as causation and the self. Moreover, given the first principle of the science of human nature, questions about the origin of our ideas tend to follow a certain pattern. Uh, ideas are copies of impressions. And so an adequate account of uh, their origin involves explaining how these ideas are the products of the impressions that they resemble. Moreover, it seems this pattern is continued in book three. According to Hume's sentimentalism, all moral distinctions are grounded in sentiment, a kind of impression. So uh, to ask uh, for the idea of justice is to ask for the impression upon which this distinction between justice and injustice is grounded. However, the distinction can't be grounded in any natural human motivation. Now, the circle discussed last time provides one obstacle. Here, however, Hume is emphasizing another, namely the partiality of natural affection. Here's, here's Hume, let me get this. He says, uh, now it appears <clears throat> that in the original frame of our mind, our strongest attention is confined to ourselves, our next is extended to our relations and acquaintances, and tis only the weakest which reaches to strangers and indifferent persons. This partiality then and unequal affection uh, must not only have an influence on our behavior and conduct in society, but even our ideas of vice and virtue. So evidently, the idea of uh, justice must be uh, par impartial and equal in the way that none of our natural passions are. <clears throat> We've seen Hume even go so far as describe uh, the laws of justice, uh, uh, justice as laws of equity. And since our natural passions are partial and unequal, they can't give rise to the idea of justice since it doesn't resemble any natural passion in being impartial and equal. Okay, so instead of posing a coordinative and motivational problems like the hobbist, we've got rather an ideological problem, namely where on earth does our idea of justice come from? Right? If we genuinely have this idea, which is impartial and equal, it's got to be traceable back to some impression, but it looks like all of our natural passions uh, are uh, partial and unequal. Okay, So where on earth is the impression that's grounding our idea of justice? It's that ideological problem that is Hume's problem. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now, um, let's see how he goes about uh, solving this. Um, now, Hume's going to make negative and positive claims about the conventions uh, of justice. Uh, so the negative claim is that conventions aren't promises. Why? Well, uh, uh, promises, according to Hume, are themselves based on conventions, right? And so, uh, and so can't give rise to conventions, okay? And so later on, he gives an account of uh, promising based on conventions. And in a way, this is Hume's anti-contractualist uh, point. His targets are Hobbes and Rousseau. Uh, they, they seem to think of conventions roughly on the model of promising, and that's a mistake according to Hume. Conventions, he says, here's the positive claim, involve a general sense of common interest. And that's Hume's gloss on the attitudes that are involved in entering into a convention. Uh, um, now, uh, Hume's positive characterization of the attitudes that give rise to convention requires a little bit of interpretation. Um, 
fortunately, Hume explains a little bit more and allow me to read you this passage. He says, I observe that it will be of my interest to leave another in possession of his goods, provided he will act in the same manner with regard to me. He is sensible of a like interest in the regulation of his conduct. When this common sense of interest is mutually expressed and is known to both, it produces a suitable resolution and behavior. And this may properly enough be called a convention or agreement between us, uh, though without the interposition of a promise, since the actions of each of us have reference to those of the other and are performed upon the supposition that something is to be formed on the other part. Okay, what I want to bring your attention to is this talk of suitable resolution. Now the resolution here isn't, as it were, a solution to a problem, although in effect it is. The resolution rather is a kind of intention or commitment. Think about how when, uh, when we speak of resolving to undertake a certain uh, course of conduct, right? That's to adopt an intention to pursue that course of conduct, okay? Um, now, uh, um, the, uh, this resolution, uh, is an intention or co commitment that, conf that the conflicting parties settle upon when their common uh, interest is mutually expressed and known to both, right? Specifically, right? Uh, the suitable resolution is going to be a conditional intention to leave the other in possession of their goods provided they do the same. Right, so it's the thought is, uh, I'm going to leave you with your stuff. You're going to leave me with my stuff. So uh, as long as you leave me with my stuff. Now, uh, if we're in a situation where we sense that that's what's going to be best for us, uh, and we recognize that both of us have this conditional intention then we've established a kind of agreement or convention according uh, uh, to Hume. Uh, uh, notice this intention's framed uh, on, on the basis of self-interest. It thus doesn't depend on relations the conflicting parties bear to one another, right? So uh, the other party to the agreement doesn't have to be my kith or kin. Uh, the relevant feature of the conflicting party is not somehow similarity or affiliation or any other relation to us, but rather simply their acceptance of the relevant conditional intention. Uh, so the suitable resolution is impartial and equal in the way that our natural affections are not, and thus can be a, an impression that can ground our idea of justice. Okay. So let's sort of sum all this up, right? Uh, justice only arises under certain conditions. The circumstances of justice includes the scanty provision of nature and man's uh, selfishness and confined generosity. The natural affections of human beings are partial and have a tendency to conflict. In such circumstances, it's in the self-interest of each to constrain at least some of their ends uh, for the sake of mutual advantage. Specifically, it's in the interest of each to leave the other in possession of their goods, provided that they do the same. And when this general sense of common interest is mutually expressed and known to both, this uh, gives rise to the corresponding conditional commitment. And this commitment since it only requires the co-commitment of the conflicting party, doesn't depend upon their affiliation or other relevant relation to us. It's thus impartial and equal in a manner suitable to give rise to the idea of justice. Okay, so that was the genealogy of justice, okay? Uh, we're going to talk now about the second part of Hume's account. Remember, uh, he first talks about the original motive to justice, 
right? Uh, uh, the uh, motive and circumstances that first establishes the conventions of justice, and then, unlike the natural virtues, gives a completely separate account of the merit of that attaches to the observances of these uh, conventions. Um, um, so let's begin to talk then about uh, the moral uh, beauty of just actions. So the common sense of interest and the suitable resolution that it gives rise to may be the original motive of justice, but it doesn't explain the merit that attaches to the observances of the conventions of justice. And while Hume has provided a genealogy of justice, he has yet to provide an account of the moral beauty of uh, its obser uh, observances. He's yet to explain, as he puts it, why we annex the idea of virtue to justice and vice to injustice. <clears throat> now, the suitable resolution grounded in the common uh, sense of interest may be sufficient motivation to observe the conventions of justice. However, when society uh, stabilizes and expands, this original motivation has a tendency to wane. Here's Hume. But when society has become numerous and has increased to a tribe or nation, this interest is more remote nor do men uh, readily perceive uh, that disorder and confusion fall upon every breach of these rules as in a more narrow and contracted uh, society. Well, fortunately, right, in a civilized state, there, there arises a number of subsidiary uh, motivations. Um, uh, uh, now, <clears throat> um, let's, Recall the sentimentalist conception of virtue described in chapter one. Virtue consists in those actions, passions, or characters that gives rise to a distinctive kind of pleasure upon the uh, general view or survey, and vice is concerns those actions, passions, and characters that give rise to a distinctive kind of displeasure upon the general view or uh, survey. Now, in a civilized state, human beings have a tendency to be displeased by acts of injustice, even uh, when uh, neither they nor their kith or kin are the victims of injustice. Uh, just think of the phen modern phenomena of rage clicks. Uh, since this displeasure is impartial in this way, uh, it, can, it, it, it can only be the determination of vice and uh, uh, in the act of injustice. Now, Hume's thought is uh, when we're displeased uh, by some uh, failure to observe the conventions of justice, even if this affects a person wholly unknown to us, right? How does this displeasure come about? Well, Hume thinks that uh, 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 the advantages of society are evident to us. Uh, and in effect, uh, we come to sympathize with the public utility of the conventions of justice. And it's this sympathy with the public utility of the conventions of justice, that's going to explain the displeasure we feel when uh, we observe the conventions of justice uh, being violated, even when, right, it uh, doesn't affect anybody who is importantly related to us, right? So the explanation of the merit that attaches to the observances of justice crucially involves, right, uh, sympathy with the public uh, uh, good. Um, now, um, we've seen how Hume sought to accommodate 
uh, the talk of combat of reason and passion, uh, despite reason's impotence, by reconstruing it as the combat between calm and violent passions. We can see at this point uh, in Hume's uh, account of the artificial virtue of justice, uh, an attempt to accommodate another phenomenon of morality recognized by uh, the vulgar, namely the potential conflict between duty and inclination about which Kant uh, uh, will have a lot to say, right? So we'll be talking about this a lot more uh, after reading week. Just as talk of combat and reason, uh, 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 just as talk of combat of reason and the passions seem to threaten Hume's contention that reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions, so talk of conflict of duty and inclination seems to threaten Hume's account. Uh, so remember, the manifestation of a uh, natural virtue invariably results in some good. But that fails for the artificial virtue of justice, right? Uh, a particular observance of the conventions of justice may result in personal or public harm, right? Again, if I owe money to an enemy and they're gonna use those funds to thwart my interests, duty says I must repay them even if it's not my self-interest. Or if they happen to be something like a bond villain who's going to use the funds to thwart the public good, duty still requires me to repay this debt even if it's against the public interest. Um, so, uh, and in general, public utility attaches to the general scheme or convention and not to any particular observance of the conventions of justice. Um, so notice there may be nothing that recommends a particular observance of the conventions of justice from a partial point of view. Self-interest may prompt the suitable resolution that institutes the rules of justice, but when moral beauty is attached to particular observances, there arises this additional mo motive. In developing a sense of justice, we're motivated to act in accordance with rules of justice just because, well, that's what justice demands, uh, regardless of whether there's anything else that would recommend uh, itself to us. Well, since conformity to convention does not require that particular observances have a single attractive feature, it may lack any attractive feature and may in fact be quite un unpleasant, right? Uh, and notice, right, that's just the kind of thing that people have in mind when they talk about duty and inclination. Namely, duty requires you to do one thing, but you're not inclined to do it. Uh, Hume's account of the artificial virtues allows him to, in effect, accommodate the conflict of duty and inclination within a sentimentalist framework. Now, that's an important point when uh, we're going to be assessing uh, sentimentalism versus rationalism. Again, uh, Kant is going to stress the conflict between duty and inclination, and he's going to develop a very different conception of ethics, a rationalist conception of ethics, so it's important that we recognize uh, this small uh, accommodation that holds for the artificial virtues, if not for the natural uh, 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 virtues. Okay, um, let me just briefly uh, return to the circle. Um, how does Hume's account of artificial justice solve the problems we talked about last time? Uh, well, we saw that naturally virtuous actions have merit and are the objects of moral approbation insofar as they're motivated in the relevant way, and it's their being motivated that bestows merit upon them and makes them the object of approbation. So if justice were a natural virtue, 
Just actions would have merit and be the objects of moral motivation. It just thinks so far as they're motivated in the right sort of way, and it's their being so motivated that would bestow merit upon them. Uh, however, just actions don't satisfy those two conditions. Um, uh, Hume's circle established that. Uh, well, uh, what could be the relevant motive? Now, on Hume's genealogical account, the first motive to justice, the resolution prompted by a general sense of common interest, mutually expressed and known to both, uh, uh, is uh, that may establish the conventions of justice, but as distinct motive bestows merit upon them, right? It's not the resolution uh, that bestows merit upon just acts, but rather sympathy with the public utility of the general scheme or, or, or convention that bestowed uh, merit upon its observances. So there's no single motive that plays both roles, right? And that's how justice properly conceived avoids the circularity. And it's only by conceiving of justice as an artificial virtue that we can avoid, as Hume puts it, evident sophistry and reasoning in a circle. <clears throat> Okay, so I want to end uh, our discussion of Hume with some material that occurs at the very, very end of the treaties. Now, uh, I've emphasized throughout that Hume's projects primarily descriptive and explanatory, right? Um, he's like a sociologist or anthropologist. He wants to describe our, our moral practices, and he wants to offer an explanation of them, right? Uh, well, Hume's sentimentalism purports to explain the moral judgments that we make, given the character of that explanation, it ends up vindicating those moral judgments. And Hume believes that once we've understood the uh, fully the sentimentalist explanation of moral judgments will naturally prove not only of the judgments that we in fact make, uh, but of the principles that govern them, our sense of morals. Um, now, uh, um, and he says that uh, uh, when we approve of our moral sense, uh, uh, these uh, principles uh, uh, will be strengthened, okay? Uh, now, um, um, uh, the knowledge, right, that Hume as a moral scientist seeks is a kind of self-knowledge, right? Uh, the moral scientist uh, wants to uh, uh, explain the distinctions we make between vice and virtue in terms of our common human nature extended where it is by human convention. Uh, and in learning about the few general principles that govern the diverse phenomena of um, uh, uh, human sentiment and that determine the um, uh, judgments of vice and virtue, we learn about ourselves, right? We learn about uh, uh, our nature and our place in nature, right? We learn what kinds of creatures we are. So it's a kind of self-knowledge. And while reason alone uh, uh, can never determine the will nor uh, the passions determination, or oppose the passions determination of the will, the self-knowledge we gain from Hume's inquiry is uh, apparently not ent uh, entirely indifferent to us. We come, as Hume says, to naturally approve of the moral judgments and the principles that give rise to them. So the human affective sensibility uh, must be so configured that the kind of self-knowledge afforded us by Hume's science of human nature is naturally pleasing to us upon the general view or sur survey. And not only is this self-knowledge pleasing to the human sensibility, uh, 
it helps to transform our moral character. In particular, this self-knowledge strengthens our virtuous character. Here's Hume. But this sense of morals must certainly acquire new force when reflecting on itself, it approves of those principles from whence it is derived and finds nothing but what is great and good in its rise and origin. So in approving of the principles that determine our moral sense, the moral sense acquires new force. It gains new strength. Now, of course, strength is a matter of causal control. Thus, the causal influence of our sense of morals would tend to increase once it reflects on and approves of the principles upon which it is founded. In the case of the artificial virtues, such as justice, uh, this would be manifest in increased ability of the sense of duty, the sense of the moral beauty of uh, particular observances of the conventions of justice, to oppose other passions that might conflict with it, such as selfishness, right? And the categorical nature of these demands would be strengthened. So though Hume sets out to be an anatomist of morals rather than a painter of virtue, nevertheless, the kind of self-knowledge we gain from the science of human nature has a natural tendency to transform our moral character uh, by strengthening the operation of our moral sense. So in gaining this self-knowledge, our moral character is transformed. Like Socrates before him, Hume sees a connection between self-knowledge and human virtue. Now, the precise connection he sees is perhaps the finest expression of Humean optimism. Uh, Humean optimism is, a char is characterized by a realistic, if cheerful, appraisal of human uh, nature. Uh, we're not utterly selfish, but rather, uh, are, are, but neither are we angels. Uh, even given this realistic and balanced uh, conception of uh, human motivation, Hume is pleased with what it gives rise to, the moral distinctions it makes, and the principles that govern these, a fact that's uh, perhaps echoed in the pleasure that many take in uh, the character of the author of the treatise. Now, <clears throat> I've been emphasizing the potentially transformative nature of self-knowledge uh, uh, because one, it's playing up, uh, as I mentioned, upon this well-known Socratic theme. <clears throat> Socrates too held that self-knowledge can potentially transform our moral character. <clears throat> but we'll see the same theme again in Kant, right? Kant's own project can be understood as a project of uh, self-knowledge. And moreover, it too will have a uh, potentially have a transformative character, uh, a transformative effect on our moral character. Although, uh, the precise way in which uh, self-knowledge can transform our moral character will be different in the case of Kant than in the case of Hume. But for now, uh, what's important is, despite Hume being a moral scientist whose primarily, primary, prim, primary aim was to uh, describe and explain our moral practices, uh, since he thinks once the explanation is set up and understood, we'll naturally approve of the principles upon which it's founded, and this will strengthen them. Uh, in a way, the sentimentalist explanation of morals is in this way self-vindicatory, right? Uh, uh, it, it will be, tend to reinforce, so there's a kind of in the end, in this odd sort of way, uh, a, a normative uh, twist uh, to Hume's account and this despite, again, his uh, account uh, being primarily uh, descriptive and explanatory. Uh, and once again, uh, I'm, I'm emphasizing the, this theme of how uh, uh, self-knowledge can be potentially transformative of our moral character because we'll see it again 
when we talk about uh, Kant when we return uh, from uh, Reading Week. Okay, uh, that's all I have for today. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, we'll see you uh, when we begin talking about uh, Kant. Thanks.